Um, when I was in seminary, the seminary that I attended only allowed women to take an intensive summer course. So the degree that we could work for took us several summers to complete, and it was just like drinking from a fire hydrant. It was pretty intense. But the struggle for me was always to find a nine-month job where I could save up money to pay for the next summer's tuition. One year, I worked for a Christian dentist, a man who was a member of my church. And um, as it turned out, he was abusive. <coughs> Working for him was my first exposure to emotional and, um, emotional and verbal abuse. I was blindsided with, when on the first day of work, he began to uh, shame and demean and mock me as I tried to work. It didn't matter how hard I tried, nothing would please him. And this went on for weeks. It finally led up when another new employee arrived and he turned his abuse on her. Evidently his way of breaking in a new employee was to abuse them. His abuse was never sexual or physical, but it took a physical toll on me that took weeks to overcome once the abuse stopped. Over the past two years, sexual harassment and assault have been in the headlines in the United States, and I'm guessing elsewhere as well, and that story isn't going away. A litany of women, once bullied, threatened, and intimidated into silence, rose up to voice allegations against very powerful men who previously got away with their abusive actions. The tipping point proved to be the ouster of Hollywood mogul Harvey Weinstein. And that led to multiple resignations and firings. Over 71 followed in pretty quick succession. It also uh, triggered an avalanche on Twitter. If you're familiar with social media, you know everybody globally uses Twitter, and there are hashtags that are used, that's the little symbol, um, to join a community talking about the same thing. And so this triggered an avalanche of Me Too tweets where women were telling that they had also experienced abuse. Some of them were, um, all they could do was just put the hashtag up. They couldn't even say what kind of things they had been through. Um, the Me Too hashtag got translated into other languages and the movement went global it, because it is a global movement. Here in the United States, Time Magazine marked the phenomenon by naming these silence breakers their 217, 2017 person of the year. I'm not a counselor or an attorney or a law enforcement officer. I'm a biblical scholar. And my research has convinced me, along with you, that those who follow Jesus belong at the forefront of this crisis, no matter who commits the abuse or what form it takes. I'm also convinced that we have responsibility to prevent it from happening in the first place. Yet instead of being active in that, we have serious abuse problems of our own. The Me Too Twitter storm was followed immediately by a damning Church Too Twitter storm. This was deeply distressing to me, as you can imagine, because I love the church. I'm a pastor's daughter. I grew up in the church. I owe an enormous debt to the ministry of the church to me. So I was distressed, but I also wasn't surprised because I hear these stories all the time. I work with women, and they tell me their stories. And many of our evangelical churches don't have a very good track record when it comes to dealing with abuse and assault when it's raised. We've had some major scandals in major Christian organizations that have you know, illustrated just how badly we are at dealing with these issues. 
Sexual harassment isn't confined to the secular workplace. It happens inside the church. Sometimes trauma is inflicted by trusted ministry leaders. Sometimes other Christian leaders exacerbate the problem by circling the wagon to protect the perpetrator and to protect the ministries and organizations involved. Victims are often re-abused by being disbelieved, by being pressured to forgive, forget, and move on. And all of this without involving law enforcement or professional counselors. Just days ago, the New York Times resurfaced a video of Andy Savage's apology for sexually abusing Jules Woodson when he was her youth pastor. He's, he's a, he was a member of the pastoral staff of his church when he made his apology and it was video recorded and put online and he got a standing ovation for his apology. This time, this release of the video had been changed. It was titled, I was assaulted, he was applauded. It included her commentary. She was 14 years old when he assaulted her. If the Church to movement is any indicator, we have a lot of sexual trauma in church pews today. For many of us, attorney and former USA gymnast Rachel Denhollander has become the face of both Me Too and Church Too. Her Me Too story is about her fight for justice, and it made national news in the conviction of USA gymnast Dr. Larry Nasser. She was the first woman to step forward and accuse him publicly, and she gave the final impact statement in his trial. She paid dearly when she challenged prominent church leaders over a Church Two scandal she described as widely recognized as one of the worst, if not the worst, instances of evangelical cover-up of sexual abuse. She said, I lost my church, I lost my closest friends as a result of advocating for survivors who had been victimized by similar institutional failures in my own community. In the wake of her losses, this is what she had to say about the church, and I quote, church is one of the least safe places to acknowledge abuse because the way it is counseled is more often than not damaging to the victim. There is an abhorrent lack of knowledge for the damage and devastation that sexual assault brings. It is with deep regret that I say the church is one of the worst places to go for help. That's a hard thing to say because I'm a very conservative evangelical, but that is the truth. There are very, very few who have ever found true help in the church, end quote. Well, this is where my work is relevant. I am profoundly encouraged by what I have learned just in the last day and a half from you and what you are doing to deal with trauma in the world and to cause people who are doomed to suffer the rest of their lives that they are finding healing and hope from your ministries. But in good conscience, we can't adequately address this epidemic without exploring causative factors that increase female vulnerability and allow such violations against women to occur within our own ranks. It's hard to stop sexual, assault, se sexual harassment and abuse if we create a climate that is conducive to it in the first place. Without investigating and addressing the sources of the problem, we're fighting a losing battle. So I wanna recommend four recommendations for us to consider, and I'm sure there are more that can be considered, but these are the ones that really have confronted me in all of this. We need to put our own house in order. The first is that we need to get honest 
and we need to address how we are being complicit. And I want to talk about this in three different ways, how this happens historically, politically, and theologically. Historically, the early church fathers set us up by making negative statements about women. Tertullian's infamous statement where he blamed the entire fall on Eve when he accused all women in the same time of being the devil's gateway. One of the fathers called women a sack of manure. From Augustine to Aquinas to Calvin to Luther, patriarchy has been the norm in Eastern and Western Christianity. But, but patriarchy is a fallen cultural social system that empowers men over women and some men over other men. We owe these shapers of Christianity, of shaping our Christian theology, we owe them a lot. But when it comes to their views of women, they were wide of the mark, and they have done a lot of damage. They made the common mistake of thinking the Bible is teaching patriarchy, but patriarchy isn't the Bible's message, it's the backdrop to the Bible's message. It is the cultural backdrop that sets off in the sharpest relief the power of that message, the counter-cultural radical power of that message. It's the perfect culture to set off in sharp release that Jesus meant what he said when he said, my kingdom is not of this world, not a kinder, gentler way of doing the way the rest of the world does things, but a radically different gospel way of doing things that reflects Jesus and his kingdom. So we have our work cut out for us to overcome generations of negative views of women. And that's a good place for us to begin. But we also need to address this politically. And I realize this may be stepping on toes for some people, but America's evangelical church's moral authority suffered a tremendous blow in the last presidential election. When the Access Hollywood tape was revealed, showing uh, the, the voice of candidate then, Donald Trump, boasting about assaulting, sexually assaulting women. And then that was followed by over a dozen women who came forward with allegations that Trump had done exactly that to them. The whole country watched while well-known Christian leaders doubled down on their support of him, along with 81% of evangelicals. I understand that there are a lot of issues that were involved in that election, but what happened registered deeply with women, both inside and outside the church. We need to look honestly at how our political passions can disqualify us from leading the fight to end abuse. And then we need to think theologically. My dental office experience doesn't rise to the level of the kinds of abuses I'm talking about. But Me Too stories have shed new light on my experience. During my ordeal, I turned to three Christian men who I knew loved me and I was very close to. I looked to them for help. They were appalled by my boss's behavior. But they were also clueless when it came to giving me advice about what to do. One considered confronting him on my behalf, but feared that might make things worse for me, and I think it probably would have. Mainly, they prayed for me to endure. Not one of them challenged me to stand up to him, to refuse to accept his behavior. I'm not suggesting that women and girls can stop every predator. I'm suggesting 
that our messaging for women and girls puts us in a weakened and vulnerable position, which leads to my next recommendation, that we need to rethink our messaging for and about women and girls. Author Rachel Simmons put her finger on a major contributing factor when she wrote, women have been taught by every cultural force imaginable that we must be nice and quiet and polite, that we must protect others' feelings before our own, that we are there for others' pleasure. This same kind of social messaging for women intensifies in the church. We aren't taught to be strong and courageous, even though that was Paul's message for us. We aren't urged to develop the kind of backbone needed in awkward situations with the opposite sex. We aren't conditioned to be decisive and proactive. Instead, silence and submission are too often the church's watchwords for women. We hear more about these two words than anything else that addresses us as women. And both words put us at risk. Yes, both words appear in the Bible and both words appear with reference to women. But both words take on deeper meaning, more radical meaning, when Jesus' gospel redefines them. Silence the so-called silencing of women becomes a distortion when it is interpreted as a ban on the female voice. It ignores other biblical texts that validate the female voice as an indispensable source of theological instruction for all believers. What would we be missing if we didn't have the theological voices of Hagar, Deborah, Hannah, or Mary of Nazareth. Jesus gave the strongest affirmation of women's voices when he charged his female disciples to proclaim the news of his resurrection and rebuked his male disciples for refusing to believe them. Submission in the Bible is a universal call for all believers, both male and female, that ultimately points to Jesus. His brand of submission, which we read about in Philippians 2, isn't an occasional event. It's a lifestyle of sacrifice for the good of others. It is not an expression of weakness or concession. It's an act of love, strength, conviction, and a commitment to do the Father's will. It may mean saying no. Church teaching on female submission has young girls in serious dating relationships asking, when do I start submitting? It had an academic dean at a major Christian college vexed when he observed his male students looking for submissive women instead of valuing women for the strengths and wisdom a man needs from his wife. It caused one Christian father to contemplate training his energetic and gifted daughters to be more compliant. How dangerous is that? Church teaching did not empower a 14-year-old Jules Woodson when her, when her youth pastor crossed the line. We did not teach her that she could say no to a male authority figure in the church. I didn't know how to tell my dentist boss no either. We lose our voices inside the church, and that comes at a cost when we face awkward or threatening situations. It is also a loss to the church and to the men who need us to speak up. So we need to address how we are complicit, we need to rethink our messaging for and about women and girls, and we need to rethink our messaging for and about men and boys. The Me Too crisis isn't just a woman's issue, and women alone aren't going to solve it. Women can ignite the movement, 
but any lasting change requires the significant participation of our brothers. What brand of masculinity do we preach to them? Does it reinforce male power over women? Does it portray women as the problem? Or does it call men to be responsible for their own actions? Does it cast a radical countercultural vision of masculinity that reflects Jesus and his gospel? The Me Too epidemic is an abuse of power. Do we guide men and boys to exercise their power and privilege to empower others and to promote their flourishing? How would the church's reputation change for the better if we were doing that? Do we point to Jesus as the model of true masculinity? He didn't objectify or marginalize women. Instead, he valued their minds, their voices, and he empowered their ministries. Viewed against the backdrop of the ancient patriarchal culture, Jesus' interactions were shocking and radical. He broke all the gender barriers and validated and valued the women he encountered. The fourth recommendation is that we utilize the Bible's Me Too stories. Just like the Bible talks a lot about prison, it also talks a lot about Me Too. It contains Me Too stories that give pastors the opportunity to raise awareness of this issue in the church. Have we even noticed these stories? Hagar, Billa, Zilpha, and Esther were young girls who were trafficked as slaves, and sex ended up being part of the deal. Tamar and Judah's story is complicated, but Judah vindicates Tamar and he condemns himself when he calls her righteous. Telling the truth about these Me Too stories also means coming to terms with the fact that some of our biblical male heroes were deeply flawed. Bathsheba's Me Too story provides a biblical precedent for calling powerful abusers to account. The prophet Nathan described Bathsheba as a lamb and he leads King David to condemn himself and his own abuse of power and of rape. But there's good news in all of this because the Bible contains powerful narratives where a Me Too story could have happened but didn't. The Book of Ruth is Exhibit A, and I must say I will be terribly frustrated to be limited in how much I can say about that book because it has been life-changing for me. But I know most of us think of this as a beautiful romance story, but it's actually not a romance, especially when you put it against the backdrop of the patriarchal world. It is a classic story of trauma. Naomi becomes a famine refugee. That's enough to do it right there. But she also suffers the death of her husband and enters a most vulnerable demographic, becoming a widow. Her sons marry pagan girls. They go through 10 years of double infertility, which is a total calamity in a world where a girl's, a wife's job is to produce sons to preserve the family. Instead of positive pregnancy tests, they end up at the end of those 10 years with the deaths of both of her sons. It is a total wipeout for Naomi. She is a female Job, and the book of Ruth is the story of a female Job. Job questions God's justice. Naomi questions God's love. But this book is exhibit A, as I said. Ruth is at risk, and so is Naomi. For our purposes, I want to focus on the meetings between Ruth and Boaz. In both of the meetings, the meeting in his barley field and the second at the threshing floor, both of these meetings present situations that could have turned out badly for Ruth. She's young, female, foreign, a Gentile, 
She's one of, she's, she's in the most at risk demographic. In today's world, we would call her Arab. She's from Jordan, Jordan. And we would also call her an undocumented immigrant. Patriarchy deprives women of voice, agency, and legal rights, especially when there's no man in the family to protect them. Boaz is male. He's Jewish. He's in his homeland. He's a descendant of one of Israel's leading families, and he is a powerful landowner. At birth, patriarchy bestows on males power, privilege, and legal rights. Boaz fits the global profile of men who ass assault, exploit, and abuse women in today's world. Ruth's decision to glean was a matter of survival, but it exposes her to greater risk. She has to venture out in a foreign land by herself, and she becomes a common field worker. She's at greater danger at the threshing floor when she approaches Boaz in the dead of night. But this is where Ruth's story changes. And Naomi's story will change too. Both Ruth and Boaz live before the face of God, and this changes everything for them. What happens here is instructive for the church. For Ruth draws from her taking refuge under the wing of Yahweh, she draws radical courage that is absolutely mind-boggling in her circumstances. And Boaz will use his advantages in every encounter to empower her, and together, the two of them will bring healing and hope to Naomi. In the barley field, Boaz intervenes and tells his male harvesters not to touch her. At the threshing floor, when she approaches him, it's dark and no one is looking. If it came down to a he said, she said story, no one in all Bethlehem would believe her word over his. Instead, in every situation, Boaz will use his male power and privilege sacrificially to empower Ruth and ensure that her initiatives on Naomi's behalf succeed. In the end, a hungry widow is fed. A dying family is rescued from extinction. And God advances his purposes for the whole world through their actions, actions that they never knew the outcome. They become a blessing to each other, to Naomi, and to the entire world by what they do. So it's no accident that sexual abuse is in the headlines. But this is a window of opportunity for us to become a beacon of hope, a place of safety, a powerful force to end every form of violence against women globally. We may not be able to stop a lot of forces that cause trauma in today's world, but I think we can make major progress on this one by empowering women and girls to use their God-given voices and strengths and courage, to put no into their vocabulary and encourage them to use it in situations where wrong is being conducted, and by teaching men and boys that power and privilege are beautiful gifts that God has entrusted to them and that they can use those gifts. And when they use those gifts as a trust before God, the Me Too stories will stop. Thank you.